Hey, hey everybody, this is Ken Stern. I'm the director of the Bard Center for the Study of Hate. Um, I want to wait a, uh, about a half a minute because I see people are populating in. I don't want to have anybody miss the beginning. Um, but we're very fortunate to have uh, Lee Badgett with us today. And I think you will uh, all find what she has to say as edifying as I did when I read her book and had conversations with her. So anyway, so let me start now. I see we're, we're getting to a critical mass. Uh, as again, I said, I'm Ken Stern, director of the Bard Center for the Study of Hate. Um, we've uh, been privileged to do webinars around issues of hate, and I can't think of any uh, that are more relevant to our thinking about this than questions intersecting what hatred costs. And that's one of the things that the center is doing, driven by uh, Mike Martell, who's an economics professor, and funding from GS Humane. Um, we're going to produce the first you know, of its kind uh, index into what the costs of hate are from the conclusion that if there's a problem in society and you don't quantify what its costs are, it's very difficult to have conversations about both its seriousness and what to do about it. And one of the things that we've done is to um, pull together a team of experts to help us think through what do you include? What do you not include? Uh, how do you think about it? Uh, what are the offsets? It's not an easy question to think about quantifying hate. And one of the first people that Mike reached out to uh, is Lee Badgett. And it's very clear why, why Lee was the, you know, one of the first people that he thought of. Um, she's done groundbreaking work uh, and most recently uh, evident in her book, which um, you will hear a lot more about, but it's the economic case uh, for LGBT equality. Um, and it's, it's really sort of a blueprint for how we're all thinking about the larger question. So I wanted her to talk about her book and her research and her thinking about these issues uh, and share them with you today. So let me give a brief introduction. Then what we're gonna do is I'm gonna turn it over uh, to, to Lee. Uh, who's going to uh, speak and then we'll do a question and answer. And the way the question and answers will be done is that there's a Q and A box, type in your questions. I will uh, combine some where it's appropriate uh, and ask them to Lee and then we'll uh, conclude in about uh, an hour. So anyway, uh, thank you Lee for sharing your time and expertise with us. Uh, and let me give a short introduction for everybody. So Lee Badgett is a professor of economics and co-director of the Center for Employment Equity at the University of Massachusetts Amherst. And she's the former director of the School of Public Policy. She's also a Williams Distinguished Scholar at UCLA Williams Institute, where she was a co-founder and the first research director. She has a PhD in economics from UC Berkeley and a BA from the University of Chicago. Her research focuses on economic inequality for LGBT people, uh, including wage gaps, employment discrimination and poverty, and on the global cost of homophobia and transphobia. Her books on LGBT economic issues have debunked the myth of gay affluence and have shown that same-sex marriage is good for society. Badgett has testified as an expert witness in legislative matters and litigation, including as an expert witness in California's Prop 8 case. Her work as a, quote, public professor includes analyzing public policies, consulting with regulatory bodies, briefing policymakers, and writing op-ed pieces. Lee, we're delighted to have you with us today. Thanks so much, Ken, um, both for having me and for inviting me to be part of the Cost of Hate Project, which is a very exciting initiative that you all are working on. I'm going to just pull up a couple, of, a few slides here uh, to, to talk about the book that, that Ken has very uh, lo lovely, lovingly mentioned <laughs> um, and talk a little bit about why I want to approach this this way. We're used to thinking about LGBT rights as human rights issues. And I certainly, I do think about it that way uh, primarily. Um, but as an economist, I also um, recognize that there is a uh, another reason for uh, for having human rights, or we could call it LGBT inclusion, um, other than the fact that it's good for LGBT people. Um, and that is that it's good for our economy. So I'm primarily going to talk about that angle today, um, how LGBT inclusion and human rights actually um, are beneficial for, for the economy. 
And just primarily, just to kind of give you a, a sense of where I'm gonna go with this, um, I'm thinking about it as uh, LGBT inclusion increasing both the, the human capital, the skills, the knowledge, the creativity of LGBT people and uh, their economic potential. So by expanding both uh, human capital, uh, we're going to expand economic potential and that's what's gonna be good for economies. So let me start with, um, it's not exactly, I guess, at the beginning, but it's pretty close uh, for most people um, in terms of thinking about education and how uh, exclusion in the education context uh, creates, uh, creates economic harm. It certainly creates harm for LGBT young people. And I use uh, in the book, the example of a young man named Pema Dorji, who's now an activist. He's, he grew up in Bhutan. Uh, and as a, as a young budding gay man, um, he went to school, which he described as like going to war. Um, in addition to the usual school subjects, he also learned that he would be a target of bullying by other students. And in many cases, actually similar bullying by teachers who were not helpful to him, who did not protect him from, from being bullied. Uh, what, uh, the other thing that he learned out of this experience is that what he wanted to do uh, as, a, as an adult and what he's doing now is being a gay activist to make sure that other young people there uh, don't face those same kinds of challenges. But unfortunately, they're still very common. Uh, bullying in general is actually very common across schools all around the world. Um, but bullying against LGBT people is even um, worse. Um, so UNESCO, the United Nations agency that, um, that uh, studies education issues, um, and does work in that field, um, fairly recently did a big scan of the entire globe and found studies from 94 different countries that confirmed the challenges that LGBT young people face in school systems. Now the bullying that they experience um, has psychological harm in and of itself, but it also is bad for the educational experiences of those, uh, of those young people. Um, we know from research in several different countries where it's been conducted so far that bullying will reduce people's grade point averages. It leads to higher levels of absenteeism. People are more likely to drop out and to not continue on, say, to university education, uh, even when they're capable of it. So this is holding back young people from, uh, from being able to get the education that they need and that they're capable of. And that in and of itself uh, is bad for the economy. We know as economists uh, that, that education and that kind of human capital is one of the most important things that predicts the success of, of economies. Uh, so, so the treatment of LGBT young people um, is going to hold them back and hold back the economies. And what's interesting too, what I learned in studying this was that bullying doesn't just hurt young people in general, but it actually can have much broader effects. Uh, now we don't know this in the LGBT context, but bullying more generally is bad for schools uh, and for all, the for all of the students in them. Um, schools where there's a lot of bullying that happens actually have lower average test scores for example. So, uh, so bullying is a problem for the LGBT young people uh, and holds them back and it holds back all students. Now when they get when LGBT young people get to the workplace context, things don't uh, things are different uh, but don't necessarily get any better. Employment discrimination is still a very common experience. Um, in different parts of the world, and actually also here even in the United States, if we ask LGBT people in surveys, have you faced discrimination, very commonly they say yes. So in the US it's about one in five uh, LGBT people reports that they've experienced some kind of discrimination in their work life. Um, and uh, we know that that has, uh, that has lots of ramifications. For one thing, discrimination tends to reduce wages. Gay and bisexual men have been shown in many, many studies in, in the US and in some other countries to have lower wages than heterosexual men who have the exact same kinds of employment uh, qualifications in terms of education and experience. Um, but they earn about 11% less on average around the world in these studies. We know from experiments that, um, that uh, LGBT people um, are treated differentially by employers. There's a whole, uh, you might not normally think of economists as doing exper experiments, but 
uh, these particular ones are really, uh, really quite clever. They take two resumes and they, on one of them will kind of code it as being LGBT. They'll have the name of, of an LGBT organization say that somebody has been a part of or for a transgender person, a, a, a birth name. Um, and we'll uh, match it to a, basically an identical one that doesn't have that and send it out. And, uh, and what they find is that those simple labels, one line on a resume that might indicate that somebody is LGBT has, makes a big difference in whether or not those job applicants get called back. So one study showed that for, uh, uh, for straight men, uh, they had to apply for about nine jobs in order to get a call back for an interview. Gay men, on the other hand, had to apply for 14 jobs in order to get just one call back. So this is, a, again, a kind of a headwind that, uh, that people are facing getting jobs in the labor market. Um, so what's the effect of this discrimination? As I said, it's uh, personally, it can mean lower wages. It can mean uh, less likely, being less likely to have a job. Um, it can, uh, but it can also reduce people's productivity and their turnover. Uh, in jobs. And that, those are the kinds of things that employers care about. We'll come back to that in a few minutes. But uh, some of those effects um, might be to drive people into the closet to keep them from disclosing who they are in the workplace, their, their sexual orientation or gender identity. That actually turns out to be bad for their health, but also uh, bad for building relationships with coworkers uh, and, building, um, and you know, building trust, authenticity. Um, secondly, people are steered out of jobs where they might be more productive. Um, sometimes there are outright bans on certain kinds of jobs. We still see that in the U.S. military for transgender people. The one for lesbians and, and lesbian, gay, and bisexual people was removed a few years ago, but they're still there for, for transgender people. In other cases, people might be steered out of jobs where they would be more productive. Um, uh, in the sense of uh, re reacting to stereotypes about LGBT people and keeping them out of jobs that, um, for keeping gay men out of jobs that are stereotyped as being very masculine or keeping lesbians stereotyped out of jobs that are, that are seen as being very feminine. So, uh, so even, even in an era when we think things have gotten a lot better um, and we think we have more gay friendly workplaces, there's still a lot of room for improvement at the very least. Um, the, the last kind of personal area I wanna talk about is health. Um, not surprisingly, experiences like the ones I've talked about in the education realm or in uh, employment are things that are very stressful for people. And uh, psychologists call this minority stress. The idea here is that we all face different kinds of stressors every day. That's not, that's not what's, what's uh, surprising about this. But that for groups like LGBT people or women or people of color, uh, on top of those stresses, there are the additional ones that are related to, to stigma and to being treated differently. Um, and that um, creates an extra burden on people's uh, coping abilities and can lead to being more likely to get sick. Uh, we know that there are health disparities for LGBT people. They face more um, anxiety and depression. They experience uh, higher levels of substance use. They are more likely to have HIV. They're more likely to think about or actually uh, attempt suicide. Um, they face more violence. There are many different kinds of health uh, concerns that, are, uh, that result in these, in these health differences. Um, and Health is kind of like education. It's another form of human capital. It, it affects what people can, can bring and actually uh, um, employ in a, in a job. So, uh, so that's going to have the same kind of harmful effects on people's ability to, to be fully productive, to be a full participant in the workplace. Um, the good news, I'll just say, is that we are we're coming up with more and more um, uh, evidence that we can actually change that though. Um, and that is from having more inclusive policies. There have been studies that show that bad policies, LGBT negative policies, actually tend to reduce people's uh, health, their health status. But when policies are better, um, there, are, uh, there are smaller health disparities. So to me, at any rate, that, that gives me some hope that maybe some of, this, uh, some of the impact of stigma on people's health may lessen over time. So 
uh, it's interesting uh, to think about it this way, because uh, I've talked more about kind of how it affects uh, LGBT people's experience in the workplace, what they can do in the workplace, um, and in these uh, uh, more economic settings. And um, thinking about it from the employer perspective, um, it, it sort of uh, corroborates uh, this, this argument that I'm making. Uh, employers have long talked about what they call the business case for LGBT equality. And that business case is really about um, arguing that it's not just the right thing to do to treat LGBT employees well, but that it's also good for business outcomes. So I just flashed a little quote from a screen up here from a, uh, from an, uh, a friend of the court brief that a bunch of businesses filed uh, back in 2013 for one of the marriage equality cases that went to the Supreme Court. And since then, the, there have been lots of these uh, kinds of briefs that have been filed by businesses making exactly the same argument, which is that um, discriminatory laws or settings are bad for business because it means that they cannot recruit, they can't hire, they can't hang on to the best workers and, and, and put them in an environment that allows them to perform at their best. So those are, uh, uh, those are reasons why businesses have gotten on board uh, very early, actually, in many cases, um, in terms of uh, LGBT inclusion, thinking about LGBT inclusion. And I'll just mention a couple of other things about this. Uh, a few years back, some colleagues and I reviewed a bunch of studies on, um, uh, that actually you know, say, well, let's test that out. You know, businesses, businesses say that, but do we really see that in, um, in, in the real world? And we do. So studies of LGBT people who work in climates that are more positive uh, have showed some uh, very clear patterns. People have uh, greater job commitment, better health outcomes. They, they are more satisfied with their jobs. They like them better. They're more open, their workplace relationships are better. These are all things that employers care about and that lead to uh, more productive workplaces. Another line just goes right to the heart of the matter and says, well, let's look at profits. Let's look at uh, actual financial outcomes. Uh, so the latest research that's coming out testing this business case, again, finds very clear evidence that companies that have more LGBT positive policies have higher stock prices, uh, have higher profits, have higher productivity. In some cases, there's one study that shows that they're able to attract a more creative workforce. So on the positive side, businesses see that as being um, something that's good for them. Uh, if it's good for LGBT people, it's good for General Motors, I guess we could say. Um, and uh, what's, what I find particularly interesting, and we could talk some more about this in the Q&A if you're interested, is that businesses are actually willing to act on this, uh, this perspective. So a few years back when North Carolina passed what was called the bathroom bill, which basically required discrimination against uh, transgender people, many big companies that have been planning expansions or, or, or new facilities being built in North Carolina said, oh, hold on we are not going to do that. And then a bunch of big events that were normally held there said, you know, no, we're not going to do that. NBA uh, All-Stars game, nope. Uh, NCAA basketball championship, nope, we are not going to do that. The state of North Carolina uh, and its economy and its people lost uh, uh, almost $4 billion of economic spending there. Uh, and that's a lot of jobs, actually a lot of jobs of heterosexual people that were lost really because uh, and because of the, uh, the, the homophobia and transphobia of uh, the state legislature there. So that's kind of the different levels, sort of from the individual to thinking about uh, what happens at the business level. And I want to just say just a little bit about country level economies, because I think that's, you know, kind of the last, uh, the last piece. And I got just a couple graphs. I'm an economist. I got to show you some graphs. So uh, one is uh, from a study that we did a while back that we've replicated several times with other data sets um, that looks at whether or not countries that have more positive policies actually do better economically, more positive policies for LGBT people. So uh, we've got an index of, of um, that uh, the author of it called the Global Index on Legal Recognition of Homosexual Orientation. That's on the bottom uh, axis. And then on the side, we've got uh, GDP per capita. And you could see from the way the points are scattered in that nice little line I drew for you, that, um, that uh, countries that have more 
uh, rights for LGBT people actually uh, have higher GDP per capita. Um, we can do the same thing um, with, uh, with transgen a transgender rights index. Again, more rights for transgender people goes along with, uh, with um, uh, a higher GDP per capita. Um, and then we've also done this you know, with all sorts of fancy econometrics kind of looking at um, uh, what happens when you control for the other things that affect um, that affect um, uh, GDP per capita? How how well company countries are doing, and we still find that uh, that more rights means a higher level of GDP. And this is kind of what it looked like for uh, one study of emerging economies. That's where those graphs came from. One additional right for uh, for homosexual people, whether it's decriminalization or non discrimination law or uh, the right to adopt uh, is associated with a, a, a 3% increase in GDP per capita. Uh, we did this with a bunch of other countries uh, and found again about a $1,000 uh, GDP per capita uh, effect of having one additional right. Now I just want to be clear that I'm not saying that a country that goes out and passes one of these laws immediately will get that one additional right. Uh, you know, it's possible that richer countries are just better on human rights. We can talk about that uh, in the Q&A too, if you want to. But, but it's at least it's associated with that. And I think thinking about it from the perspective of, uh, of what underlies the better treatment, if it's, you know, more access to education, less restrictions of people's productivity when they're in jobs, and better health, then, then there probably is some kind of causal link between the one additional right and, uh, and extra GDP per capita. The last, last test that we've done uh, is to just try to add it up from the ground up. Um, so I'll, I'll end with this. Uh, the, um, and four different uh, countries that we've done this in, that I've done this in, or other people have done this in, when you try to add up even just a few of the effects that we can quantify in countries like India, or the Philippines, or Kenya, or South Africa, um, uh, and try to put a dollar value on those differences, those health disparities, or the discrimination, it's about one percent of GDP. That's and that's a, a conservative, uh, a conservative estimate because it doesn't capture all the ways that uh, that uh, LGBT people are held back. But it's. A meaningful number. I mean, right now we're in the middle of a horrible uh, global uh, pandemic recession, and it's much worse than that. But but normally, in normal times, we'd say one percent losing one percent of GDP. That's not good. That's a recession. In a sense, the way I think about it is that we're putting ourselves in a permanent recession by having that kind of loss. Uh, and just to give you just a sense of what that looks like at a global level, 1% of GDP would be the entire economy of Turkey or the Netherlands. So, uh, so it's, a, it's a meaningful number. It's a meaningful number. Now why, so what do we do with uh, an argument like this? Um, uh, and uh, I guess, and why, why would I even take this on? And, you know, to be honest, uh, I, I took this on mainly because I had done this body of research, but also because I got feedback from activists saying, there's some power in the economic case. We can take that economic case and use it to open doors and have discussions with people who normally don't really care about human rights, which is kind of sad to say, you know, whether that's businesses or whether that's a global finance, or a finance ministry in a country or uh, an economic development agency or a, or a development bank, uh, one of the de multilateral development banks around the world, we can get in the door and talk to them about why they should care about LGBT people if we can show that it hurts our economies. So, so that's my hope with this argument that we will be able to open some doors and use it to get more resources for LGBT organizations change some laws and policies because I think that will make a difference. Uh, and uh, and uh, along the way, I think we need to argue for better data. I think in order to continue to measure progress to know if these disparities are going away, we've got to have better data. Uh, I think, you know, in, in lots of different areas we're coming to the conclusion that the data is, is something that we that we need to make sure that we're reaching the goals that, that we have. So with that, I will uh, I will stop and and see see what you all think about that. Great. Well, we thank you so much uh, for sharing that with us, uh, and I encourage people to uh, submit questions in the Q and A. And we have a couple, so I'll start with that. 
Um, so one question is, are there any studies or information on LGBT folks who are also members of other minority groups not highly valued in their society? Yes, there are. You know, I think, um, well, I, I could tell you what I, what I know, uh, which is more about what's going on in the US and thinking about uh, what we tend to call intersectionality. So people who have more than one marginalized identity. And in the US, you know, we can look at differences between uh, people who are assigned male at birth, people who are assigned female at birth and kind of compare those differences. We can also look at racial and ethnic differences um, within the groups of LGBT people. And the picture there is not good, as you might think. Uh, so uh, what we know is on the economic side that uh, LGBT people of color actually earn less than their white counterparts. So compare a, a, a gay black man to a gay white man, and that gay black man earns less than, than, the, heter than, the, uh, than the gay white men. Uh, they both earn less than, than heterosexual white men. Um, women, uh, lesbian and bisexual women earn less than gay and bisexual men of, uh, of pretty much any race. And, uh, um, and if you look at uh, lesbian and bisexual women, uh, the white women tend to earn more than either the black women or the Latino women. So, so there's definitely kind of these layers that, um, that uh, affect people. It looks like a kind of intersectionality that mostly pushes people farther down the economic ladder. Now, we don't really know that much about these questions in other countries, unfortunately. Uh, we probably we probably have the best data on LGBT people right here in the US. So that's that's one reason why we've been able to, to dig a little more deeply. Thank you. So the next question is, some deeply racist or bottom line oriented employers may be looking for dubious reasons for justifying discrimination against LGBTQ folks. For example, perhaps justifying in their mind if not sharing their that opinion with others that if LGBTQ groups are oppressed and may miss out on educational opportunities and may have higher rates of depression, et cetera. Perhaps it's better for them not to hire them and avoid the possibility of lower productivity. In other words, they may use this information that is meant to help marginalized groups to ramp up exclusion. Any thoughts on how to counter this? Yeah, you know, that is a very interesting question. And it's, um, it's something that we've thought a lot about in the context of, of race, for example, and of, of, of gender discrimination, and a little bit less so in terms of um, LGBT discrimination. I think the closest that we've come, I do think there's, there's some evidence that, uh, that the HIV epidemic mattered a lot for gay men and may have been one of the reasons why they actually tend to do uh, clearly worse than heterosexual men. Um, if employers are thinking, you know, this gay man might have HIV, is going to make my health insurance costs go up, uh, then uh, then they may be less likely to hire people. But I'll, I'll tell you an interesting thing. That argument was used a lot early on to argue for why employers couldn't afford uh, to give domestic partner benefits to same to, to employee same sex partners. They made exactly that argument, saying, "Well, you know, they'll, you know." have their friend or, or their partner will have HIV and then they'll just bankrupt us. And, uh, and that was a big barrier actually, but I'll tell you the, the thing that, that got us over that hump was a few employers tried it and they found it just didn't happen. Um, so, uh, so I think, you know, there's uh, maybe less of a connection now between that, you know, kind of presumption about HIV and, uh, and certainly it's a much more treatable chronic illness now than, uh, than, than it had been at one time. So, so some of that I think has, has gone away. It's still illegal to do that. <laughs> you're not really allowed to treat, you're not allowed to use a presumed group characteristic to say something about an individual. You can't, you can't treat an individual differently because of what you think about the group that they belong to. So it is illegal. So you can also, you know, kind of pursue it in that way. Um, but, but for the most part, I haven't heard too much about uh, uh, that concern about employers using those, those figures from, from studies in that way, but it would be a good thing to look out for. Thank you. And I encourage people, I see one more question. And I have a bunch too, but I want to prioritize what people are going to ask. 
So uh, thank you so much for this interesting information. My question is as follows. Unfortunately, I noticed bullying as well in relation to those who do not quote shout about supporting LGBT people in Portland, those who are not against, but simply do not emphasize their positive attitude towards LGBT community. Perhaps the most striking example that comes to mind is the case of JK Rowling. Indeed for her words that are not discriminating I guess, I guess it means against transgender people. This is, the society wanted to take her earned privilege for her work, books. I guess this is about cancel culture. In my opinion, such attacks make people from quite homophobic countries, and I speak from personal experience, I am Belarusian, who are slowly moving away from their stereotypes, just see these changes as crazy because they see the extreme nature of what's going on. I hope it do not sound rude. I just want to know your opinion. <laughs> Yeah, I think, I guess I think about that a little bit differently. I do think about it more in the context of cancel culture, as, as you were saying, Ken, um, than, than about, you know, kind of bullying for a particular argument. I think, um, I this is kind of embarrassing to admit, I've heard about this issue and I have not looked into it deeply, uh, but um <sighs> But there's definitely, uh, from the perspective of, uh, of, of transgender people, a concern that they are not seen as being sort of fully uh, equivalent to people who were assigned a, a sex at birth. You know, so a trans woman uh, it sees herself, and I think we should see her as, as you know, being the same as a as a uh, a woman who was assigned female at, at birth, um, and uh, she should be able to uh, use the same bathrooms and same sex segregated facilities. I mean, th this part is my opinion, um, and that that's you know I, in the context of what I've been talking about, I think that's good for her, and I think that's good for all of us to you know to 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 treat people equally and let them you know kind of live their lives in the way that uh, is best for them. So yeah, so in the context of J.K. Rowling, I do think that that's a little bit different uh, an issue. Okay, thank you. Next question is, given the tendency to resist change, what actions, strategies, and tactics result in change? Yeah, you know, I will say I have thought a lot about that in this context. There are some economists who believe that um, economic logic is so powerful and strong that there's an invisible hand out there, you know, kind of guiding the economy towards good outcomes. I mean, we, that's the phrase that we use. It came from Adam Smith, um, and and I will just say that it doesn't it doesn't take very long in reading history and just about any subject uh, that's related to to uh, human rights uh, to know that. Uh, that really there are a lot of very visible hands behind that kind of change. And I think that's certainly true in the LGBT rights space too. Um, and I do think collective action has proven to be very powerful on a lot of levels. Some of it's very obvious when there are organizations of LGBT people who seek you know, to educate people on an issue, to lobby legislatures, to pursue uh, impact litigation. Um, these are all strategies that have been used uh, in, in every civil rights movement in the United States uh, that I know of. Um, and then this also happens in places that might be surprising. It happens in businesses, um, you know, even businesses that aren't unionized. I mean, normally we think of collective action as being about unions, but there are also employee resource groups that have become a very common tool uh, for LGBT employees um, to come together to support each other, uh, and then sometimes to pick out particular things that they think uh, are not fair about their workplaces. And they have gone to, uh, they've gone to CEOs, they've gone to human uh, resources departments, they've gone to wherever they have to go to try to make that case. And in many, uh, in many situations, they were very successful. So basically, the whole the fortune, the whole Fortune 500 offered um, non-discrimination policies that included sexual orientation and gender identity before the law required it. Um, and mostly that was because either they were being pushed by their employees and usually that's what was happening. And then in some cases they did see that there are some other employers who they were maybe competing with for labor were doing that. So they also went that way. So sometimes the, the you know, more com you know, competitive logic does I think enhance enhance that argument. So I think those kinds of uh, 
those kinds of strategies that are really about, uh, about collective action uh, matter a lot. And then I think, uh, I think finding arguments that appeal to people, uh, having an array of arguments that you can use to appeal to people who kind of are based in different, uh, different kinds of uh, different kinds of spaces that that um, you know use draw on different logics is important. I mean, that's that's what I was talking about with regard to the kinds of uh, institutions and organizations that don't really think of themselves as being human rights organizations. They're about they're about profits if they're businesses or they're about economic development. So that's um, that's where I think uh, having a broad range of ideas can be very, uh, very important. And then the last thing I'll say, because I do think this has been uh, useful in a lot of um, contexts in the US and in other places, data can be very powerful. Sometimes that means, um, uh, you know, benchmarking kinds of data, but sometimes it just means data that shows that, you know, the experience of a pemidorgy is not, it's not a, a one-off experience. It happens to a lot of people. And that's what, that's the power of statistics is that you can say, you know, we did a survey and, uh, you know, 35% of uh, LGBT people studied had, you know, had similar experiences or actually probably be more if we were looking at experiences in schools. So, uh, so I think those are some common tools that I have seen uh, being used and, and I, and I talk a lot about all those in the book. Yes, you do. So the next question is, do you have examples of how your work has been used to improve the lives of LGBTQ people? Um, I will, I can talk about how this argument has, has been used. And I've said, already said a little bit about that, but uh, I know that, uh, that people are taking this economic argument um, into places like the World Bank. Actually, I sort of got pulled into this in terms, of, in terms of a consulting project with the World Bank to look at the cost of homophobia in India. And, uh, and people within the bank uh, had gotten a grant and said, well, the only way we're going to get the World Bank to actually do anything about LGBT people is to show them that it matters for the economy. Um, uh, and then sort of in, alongside that, uh, I think they're thinking that, you know, and also to show that there are poor LGBT people, because that's the other part of the, the World Bank mission. And so they, they have used this case. It gets talked about a lot in different contexts. It has motivated them to start to build a, an internal infrastructure that addresses LGBT issues. Um, and, uh, and it's just starting, I would say, to kind of get, get to, the, to the key parts of, uh, uh, of World Bank projects that might actually uh, make a difference for LGBT people. Um, so they wanna make sure that everyone is included in those projects and has equal access to those projects, that nobody is harmed by those projects. Um, and uh, so they are thinking about them, starting to think about them from an LGBT perspective. As I said earlier, businesses all over the place have taken into this business case into account. And, and you know, some of that I had, uh, have been working on um, for, for quite a long time also. Um, it's kind of shocking to think about how long. <laughs> But, uh, um, and, um, uh, you know, in the United States, uh, I think the marriage equality um, uh, sort of uh, movement is one that actually shows how important, um, you know, different, different kinds of research are. And some of it has been about the economic side of things. I mean, both in the context of legislative efforts for uh, voter initiatives, ballot initiatives, but particularly for court cases. Um, the ability to kind of go down the list and say, okay, nobody's gonna be hurt by this. You know, kids raised by LGBT parents do just as well. Uh, uh, LGBT, LGBT people, same-sex couples wanna get married for the same reason everybody else does. There's no harm to the institution of marriage if we let same-sex couples get married. Um, it's good for economies. People spend a lot of money on weddings. And so, uh, you know, those are often small businesses too. So that's kind of a, a two for, uh, you know. So there were like, uh, in, in one case, actually I was an expert witness in the Prop 8 case in California. And that judge had a very long list of questions he wanted answered. He wanted to know, you know, did it matter that same-sex couples, uh, you know, got married? Would it hurt the institution of marriage? You know, he wanted to know the answer to those questions. So he handed those, those questions to the lawyers and said, 
bring, bring me answers, you know? So, so I, so I do think that, you know, that's another, that's another role for, for people like us who are researchers. Thank you. The, the next question is, can you speak to the challenges involved with dealing with discrimination in a quote, progressive organization? How can the cost of discrimination be communicated to people who don't think it's happening or minimize it because of the organization's progressive bent? Yeah, that's a tough one. That's a tough one, isn't it? Um, I think, uh, uh, you know, it's hard to talk about it in, in general. Um, I mean, I think you, you know, if you've got a progressive organization that, you know, has certain kinds of values uh, underlying it, then you can, you know, sometimes point to those and sort of uh, get more attention to, to issues. Um, uh, to uh, to encourage people to listen uh, and to be willing to hear about the experiences that people have in, in those kinds of workplaces. That, that's, another, uh, that's another way to think about it. You know, the other tool that I think uh, uh, I've seen be very helpful in academia um, is, the, is the implicit bias kind of approach to thinking about, um, uh, to thinking about bias and prejudice. Uh, you know, we don't think of ourselves as being racist or sexist or homophobic. I mean, none of us wants, I, I think, I'm, I'm just going to say that. I hope none of us wants to, to, to be that way. But we do grow up, we live in societies that uh, can inculcate those kinds of uh, those kinds of ways of thinking without us realizing it. And so the implicit bias um, approach says that, or, or unconscious bias, some, some people call it, you know, says that we... Uh, you know, that, that we can have these uh, biases kind of embedded in ways that we don't recognize, but we can show you how it works. <laughs> and there's a, there's a great site, I forget what it's something like, implicitbias.org, Ken, maybe you know this, mm -hmm. that you can go to and take their test. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's about kind of matching up, uh, you know, favored groups with good words, unfavored mm -hmm. groups with bad words, and then they make you try to switch, right? Can you match yeah. up those unfavored groups with the good words and it takes people a lot longer um, and, and you'll see it for yourself and it's a it can be very shocking actually you know but it's a it's a tool to kind of recognize that and to I think uh, you know start to think about what impact that can have um, so, so anyway so those that, that kind of listening the, these other frameworks I think can, can be very helpful in getting people to think uh, think in a new way about some of these issues. Right, well, the next question, I'll add something to it because it's gonna ask you to prognosticate in a way that's gonna be challenging. How, how, will you, how will the changing direction of the Supreme Court, AKA Amy Coney Barrett, impact the forward movement for LGBTQIA equality? And, and I guess the, the, you know, the, the aspect on top of that is, you know, in my lifetime, I've seen, I remember when I was working at the American Jewish Committee and we were working with groups that were doing litigation and so forth for, um, you know, LGBTQ groups. And they were coming and said, well, you know, our real agenda is to get marriage equality. And I remember this must've been like in the early nineties, the AJC late people saying, all the other things, you know, not getting discrimination in terms of, can you go to the hospital or can you get inherit or health insurance? Those are all doable marriage. But we saw, you know, how quickly that changed, and we've seen in our lives when other things have become, you know, institutionalized. When leadership says this is okay, it creates the opportunity for others to make other arguments to make fundamental changes. So I guess, you know, the concern from the the questioner is if you start seeing an erosion of of this general principle that we're all gonna be taken care of and we all have equal rights and it's okay to discriminate in some ways and chip away at that. How do you think that's gonna impact the economics of it? Hmm. Yeah, yeah, it is hard to know about that. Um, well, th there are some different ways to think about it. I mean, one is that most of the time with the Supreme Court rules, Congress can act, you know, to kind of overturn something. So I think if there is something that's, that's, uh, you know, seen as being egregious in terms of a decision coming out uh, of the Supreme Court, that's at least possible. You know, I think about the, the, uh, the discrimination issue <coughs> uh, just last summer 
the Supreme Court basically read uh, sexual orientation and gender identity discrimination into the Civil Rights Act, um, said that's a kind of sex discrimination. And uh, this was interesting for a lot of reasons. One was it was a six to three decision. And you might think six, six Supreme Court justices voted in favor of a kind of surprising, not a surprising to some people, victory. Uh, and yeah, it did happen. So sometimes it is hard to know how justices will, uh, you know, will respond to certain kinds of cases. I'm not a lawyer. Ken, I know you are, so you can, you can tell me if I'm, you know, full of whatever. But, uh, <laughs> but I mean, you know, people said, well, you know, Gorsuch, who wrote the decision in the case, uh, you know, he had a very simple kind of way of looking at it. It was about just kind of reading the plain text of the, of the existing statute and applying it. So he said, you know, if you, if you fire a, a, a gay man or a transgender woman, those were the cases before them, uh, then you have taken sex into account because you would not have treated them that way had they been of a, the other sex. So, um, it was very simple. That was it, you know. And uh, um, so, who who would have guessed? Who would have guessed? Uh, and uh, and I guess we had Roberts as well. Yeah. So I think that's right. So you know, is John Roberts is not likely to be Anthony Kennedy, but you know, he's at least come along in some on some cases. Um, and uh, and now. Yeah, it's, so it's, it is hard to know. It is hard to know. But I think like some people have worried about marriage equality. Um, I think the bigger worry is about religious exemptions to civil rights laws and to marriage equality. Um, I, I don't think they'll undo marriage equality, um, but, uh, but, but there may be some big holes carved into it, unfortunately, yeah. So the next question is, it is not all that long ago that most LGBT people um, stayed in the closet and their status was not necessarily known to employers or colleagues. Is there any evidence comparing the discrimination and financial penalties then relative to now? Yeah, oh, I wish there were. <laughs> <laughs> I wish there were, it's gonna, it, we can't, it's hard to do that, it's hard to do that. Some people, there are some people who've tried to do that over time. Uh, actually, Mike Martell is one of them. Yeah. And I think, uh, you know, my read of, uh, of those several different studies is it's, it's a little bit hard to tell. Um, um, another paper that I'm working on with some other uh, colleagues, um, we, we tried to look at that with a consistent data source over the last 20 years, because we could look at same-sex couples over about 20 years. And actually, I'll tell you what we found. We didn't find that the gap for gay men went up or down. It pretty, stayed pretty much the same, actually. Um, and uh, you know, so so that's sort of hard to know. On the on the being more open, I mean, there's some reasons to think that that people are more open. I mean, it used to be I'm trying to remember. I forget the year. You know, it used to be like you know, 35 percent of people. No, no, maybe it was more like 40 percent, 40 45 percent of people knew somebody who uh, an LGBT person who was a family member or coworker. And now it's like 75%, you know? And if you just, if it's just about anybody, do you know anybody who's LGB, then it's like 88%. So like almost everybody knows somebody, but in the workplace, people are not that open. Uh, not as open as we think. Uh, some of the surveys that I've seen in the US show that only about maybe half of people are open to all or some of the people that they work with. So there's still a lot of people who are, very either they're very closeted or they're very selective about who they come out to. Thank you. The next question is short of boycotts, in your experience, have you found that anti LGBT politicians and parenthetically not business leaders in the United States are swayed by the data you presented? Uh, co conservative politicians? Uh, probably not. Um, no. You know, I've heard it cited in, in legislative debates. I mean, there's also, you know, the, the cynical view about the influence of, uh, of research is that people kind of cherry pick the research that supports the opinion that they already have. <laughs> I mean, I think there's probably a little bit of each. There's some of that. And I think, you know, sometimes that's what's happened. Uh, but sometimes it honestly does change their minds. I actually, uh, I tell the story in, a, in the book. Uh, I went to Australia to talk about some of the research on marriage equality. And uh, did a did a study, you know, kind of estimating how much uh, the the new weddings would uh, create in terms of economic spending in Australia, 
and I went to uh, to Tasmania, to Hobart, Tasmania, which is a gorgeous place, you know, this, this island, and uh, it's like one of the, it's like a wedding destination, uh, apparently, and um, sat down with uh, some people from the local small business council and started presenting my stuff, and I'm just talking away and looking at them, and they're like, you know, they've got their ties on, very impassive. And at the end, I stopped and, you know, kind of looked at them and they said, huh, we never thought about that. That makes a lot of sense. <laughs> <laughs> and then they actually, they, they actually started taking stands on the issue. Uh, and they cited that research saying, you know, this would be good for us. We need more weddings. Mm -hmm. Let's, we support this. This is great. So sometimes I think it does make a difference. It's, you know, it's, it's rare that I get to see it with my own eyes, but uh, in that case, I think I was seeing it with my own eyes. And are there other economists around the world that sort of picked up from what you're doing, decided that, oh, they're gonna replicate that in their societies and push it to, you know, their business uh, folks and politicians and, and other, you know, sort of public forums to uh, draw, use the data to drive that, you know, new awakening? Yeah, yeah, I have seen that in other places, definitely kind of using, you know, that idea or sort of a template or kind of a model. Yeah, yeah, I started to see that both for the, the marriage equality stuff and then for the these estimates of the cost to economies, you know, like the taking my India methodology and using it in Kenya, for example. Yeah. Yeah, well, I have one question I want to ask you. And if others have other questions, we have a few minutes, please feel free and then we'll wrap up. So one of the things that, that we've discussed and in our you know, group meeting too, which I find perplexing, is how do you distill, if you can, the difference between the cost of discrimination and the cost of hate? Because you know, the, there could be, a, hate I look at as, as demonization and dehumanization, the sort of the us versus them and the them is a danger to us. And I, you know, therefore I'm sort of noble about how I, you know, think about these people and how I treat them. And that has obviously systemic societal implications. Discrimination could be for, as, as you said, some people say, I don't see this as discrimination. This is what my church taught me. Mm -hmm. um, they don't necessarily demonize somebody. Uh, you can make the argument about whether they dehumanize them and devalue them. Um, you know, but it, it, it's not the same as saying we've got to round up all these people or they're all a danger to our existence. So, you know, as we're thinking through about the costs of this, how do you tease out, um, you, you know, what's really driven by this sort of, you know, primal us and them and, you know, that, and some just, you know, maybe less ignoble motives, but still discriminatory in practice. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it is a hard question. It is a hard question. But I don't know, maybe there's a way around this. Maybe there's a way around this. <laughs> I mean, I think about it this way. So the story about, you know, the, the religious exemption case that came before the Supreme Court a couple of years ago, the masterpiece cake. So that was this, yeah. um, this baker in Colorado who was known for making gorgeous wedding cakes. And these two gay men who were getting married came to him and asked him to make a cake for the wedding. And he said, no, he wouldn't do it uh, because, uh, uh, because it goes against his religious principles. It would seem like he's, he's uh, you know, agreeing with the fact that they are allowed to get married and, you know, kind of condoning their marriage, um, something, something like that. I forget the exact way he worded it. Um, you know, but he's, so he's acting out of his religious principles, I think, you know, I'm willing to accept that and believe that. Um, but for the two guys who who didn't get the cake from him it was like it was a blow it was a blow to their dignity it was a blow to them psychologically and was very deeply hurtful in the same kind of way that it would have been had he said i hate you go away i don't want you to you know i don't even want you to walk into my bakery uh, in some ways, there was not really a difference in terms of the effect of it. Uh, they felt it as dehumanizing, I think. Um, and, you know, maybe that's a way around having to, to parse, you know, how much of this kind of treatment is demonization and how much is, you know, some religious belief or something like that. I mean, if it has the same kind of effect, 
and, and that's my argument basically in terms mm -hmm. of uh, the economic effects then you know maybe yeah may, maybe being able to classify it as hate is not so necessary mm -hmm. it's a thought <laughs> it, it is i mean it's, it's a perplexing issue yeah. but, you know because again um the you know what you're talking about in practice is you know you analyze it or in a way that says okay what if it was another group so somebody says i have a religious problem with letting black people in or a religious mm -hmm. problem with letting women in or a religious problem so you know those those competing interests and the impact on the individual is clearly what you're talking about to you know to focus on our societal good of treating everybody the same way but you know the 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 driving force is not necessarily the you know the dehumanization they weren't saying nobody should bake that cake saying i'm not going to do it so the mm -hmm. you know the, the, it, it's it's an interesting question to try yeah. to figure out yeah i'm yeah. going to put this model together but i found your book very very instructive and in thinking through raising a lot of these issues okay thank you for that so i think we're just about at the end of the hour so I don't know if there's anything else you want to say. Um, no, great set of questions. I yeah. enjoyed the conversation with you too. Great, well, thank you. Yeah. And I encourage everybody to buy your book, which um, <laughs> thank you. because I've you know, gone through it many times, but that's a, it's an excellent book. And I really appreciate the time you spent with us today, Lee. And I really look forward to continuing working with you and Mike and many others, some of whom I know are on the, the webinar today. And, one of whom asked a question um, as, as we figure out these, these uh, tough issues together. So thank yeah, you very much. Yeah. And thank you, everyone. Well, I see one other question. Hold on a second. Let me just see. Okay. I'll ask you, this will be the last question. We have okay. Smith's market invisible hand was mentioned. Do you think that statistical investigations can detect other hidden forces, pro-LGBT or negative at work today and ways to help or hinder them? Ah, a question an economist would love. I do, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I do think that that's, a, I think that's another piece of the power of statistics is to see patterns that then you have to explain. Sometimes with statistics, it's hard to know exactly why you're seeing it. And Lord knows we can debate it forever, some of these things forever. But, uh, but it at least, you know, if we see an inequality, uh, a disparity of some kind, then it drives us to say, well, why does that exist? Um, and, uh, and, and I think that is often the, you know, kind of the push to, to think harder about what's really happening under the surface, some of the kinds of stuff that you're talking about. So I do think there's a lot of value to that. And that's the final word. Thank you very much, Lee. Thank you, everybody. And uh, have a good afternoon. And uh, we'll actually have another webinar coming up in a few weeks that those who folks will get uh, notice on, but it's about the questions of violence surrounding the upcoming election, which I think is yeah. a depressing but important topic. Anyway, thank you very much, everybody, and uh, have a good afternoon. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.